live first. Yeah, his stream is brother, not live. But... <laughs> start. Yeah, brother Alan, you can uh, start your live stream. Can you hear us? Are we ready? Oops, there we go. So you wanted me right. to share my screen right off the bat, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll leave this screen so people could see the people. And uh, let's see. If I move it to this, do you guys still show up somewhere on the live feed? Uh, and, and if you if you just share your uh, do a full screen. Uh, I think that's it. And, uh, Just do the uh, height, height at the uh, middle. Oh, like this. Yeah, and then hide the uh, hide the share. You see the Discord share. Yeah. Okay. I'll hide that. But if I do this, then I can't get to my other screen. Oh, wait a second. Um, hold on a second. Yeah, that's not that's and not working can... for me. That's you not guys aren't seeing you. it, probably, right? No, he 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 had Here. it right the first time. Yeah, let me close this up. Oops. We okay. are we are alive. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh well. <laughs> hey, one sec. Uh... Oh, I see. Hold on a second. Okay, you're saying that it's not working for you now. No, because I see all everyone. Like so what are you seeing avatar? right now? I'm seeing, seeing everyone's, everyone's avatar. avatar. Yeah. How do I get back to the... How do I get back so I can see my whole screen here? You you don't see your screen, but... Uh... Ah, there we go. All right. All right. Okay. So, okay. Welcome... Brothers and sisters uh, to the Bride of Christ, my name is Brother Michael. Thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight's topic is very interesting and can sometimes be a hotly debated topic among Christians. Uh, you know, this is why we can understand the day and the hour. And I know that most of the watchmen are saying no one knows the day and the hour. It's been uh uh use praise um by the christian community that's why one reason why we're not really digging into god's word uh deeply is because why would you know read uh, why would we read revelation understand revelation if we don't know the day and the hour that christ uh is going to take his bride but in the bible it's clearly say that if you watch um, you will know, you will know, you will understand the day and the hour. And one, uh, and there are several examples that we can uh, uh, point. It's like, you know, Noah found out the day, the hour. Uh, Lot found out the day that he will escape. And uh, Elijah knew the day that he will be taken. And what about Enoch? And also the three wise men who were watching for the stars, they knew that it's, uh, uh, they were watching and then uh, counting the calendars and they knew that it was Christ uh, that will be born on that particular day. That's why they were searching for our Lord Jesus Christ. So tonight's topic is going to be very interesting and I ask everyone to, um, you know, to really uh, follow with our Brother Allen's uh, from Ministry Rebuild, who will be teaching us, who will be facilitating the Bible study, uh, to really uh, 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 look into uh, what he is saying or what he's teaching and really um, dig deeper into uh, the scripture. Okay, so after the video, we will have, or after the teaching, we will have a chance to ask questions from uh, Brother Allen. Uh, if you don't, uh, are, he is if saying you're not in, what on Discord, uh, you can ask questions through the uh, live uh, chat. Or if you want to join us, uh, our brother uh, Al or brother Walter will be the one uh, um, uh, posting the uh, link 
to our Discord. Well, without further ado, I'd like to present to you our brother Alan from Ministry Rebuild. Uh, please, uh, brother Alan, uh, take charge. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much, Michael and everybody. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a, a fun topic, and you know, it, it's. It's interesting, you know. We were talking about it a little bit before we went live, and uh, I'll have you jump in back uh, in a couple minutes here, Michael, with what you were saying. It was like for you, because one of the things, you know, it I find it very exciting to to understand what the day and hour means. We don't kind of understand it now. We we've understood what it means, but we've understood. Even the beyond, if you will, what it means. And what I mean by that is while the whole world is stuck in the gospel of Matthew, we have the revelation of the gospels and we understand the storylines being given to the different groups of people within Luke, Mark, and Matthew, which equals pre, mid, and post. And what what I mean by exciting and also kind of frustrating is something you were talking about before. And it's exciting because when you know it, and we could prove it with the word, we can undeniably prove it. What gets exciting is, is that understanding, to be able to, to realize we've drawn that close to the Lord. He has drawn us in that close. He has led us that powerfully by his spirit that we can understand these things and not be flipping here and jumping back and forth and going all these different places. We can have a solid understanding and then spend our time in his word, not focusing on this day and hour all the time because we've understood it. So along the way, we can spend more time digging into him here and there and all around to, to understand him, to draw closer, to know him better. And that, it, that's the real exciting part. Uh, the part that's less exciting is when we try to share with people. You know, the the sharing with others is the part that gets messy. And that messy part always comes, unfortunately, from other Christians. Because Christians always want to tell us nobody knows the day or hour. And we've all been there, I'm sure. I know I used to be there. Michael has his story when he was there. And why did we believe that? Well, because that's what our pastors, uh, the few that do teach on Bible prophecy, that's what they all said. And then that's what other people on YouTube are saying. Ah, nobody knows the day or hour. And everybody goes around parroting, nobody knows the day or hour. Well, first of all, when you realize, not only realize what the day and hour means, and then you finally understand truthfully, like this is really what it is, you realize that even what they're talking about in not knowing the day or hour itself has nothing to do with the pre-trip. Zero. And when you try to share that with somebody, that not only can you show them the understanding of no one knows the day or hour, but then you could show them the understanding within the Gospels and what these Gospels are telling us about prophecy, it's, it's a task. And it's not the easiest thing in the world. In fact, it's probably one of the most frustrating things because it's hard to get people to sit down and take the time to hear it, and to follow it, and to understand it. Because most of them, like we were talking off screen, that means they have to have a shift in their thinking. It's not impossible. We've all had shifts in our thinking. So we know that it will reach those that it's supposed to reach. But on a big scale, it really, really is tough because everybody's been so ingrained if nobody knows the day or hour, you know, you were just talking about it with Amir Safari doing a teaching. Nobody knows the day or hour. But how powerful is understanding prophecy? It's extremely powerful. Michael was saying it. Others were saying it. You know, when you, when you start to really understand prophecy, as it's been revealed here in the open books, every single one of us, has dug into the word greater than we ever have in our lives before. I believe I could say that for just about everybody, if not everybody. I know it's myself and I know many others 
who are deeper into the word, seeking and searching out the Lord and his understanding from the revelation of the Gospels than they had before in their life. What's the number one reason why? Because we understood the day and hour? Nope. It was the revelation of his word. His book, his, his word, the book itself is opening to us in his revelation. And that is the key to all of this. That is, that's the root, that is the core, the foundation of everything that has been built on in the ministry is understanding what is revealed in the Gospels. And when you start to understand that, you start to dig more and you start to go to Old Testament stories and, and the epistles. And then you go into Revelation and you're seeing all these things. And now a ton of stuff starts to make sense that we all had questions for before. And does it bring up more questions? Absolutely. But are we left stumbling over them for a long period of time? Generally not. Do we know everything? Absolutely not. But have hundreds and hundreds of mysteries and parts and pieces and confusion come to clarity? Absolutely. And when that starts to get presented to somebody, when they're trying to tell you nobody knows the day or hour, and you have all of this arsenal behind you, once they start to realize some of this, even if they ponder for a second, all of their, all that they thought they knew when it comes to prophecy would have to get relearned. And I think that's one of the biggest struggles that we have. Now, one of the biggest struggles is, of course, with the church as a whole, because they don't really study. We know that about 90% of the church doesn't really spend time digging into the word. That's called the sleeping church. The ones that aren't diligent, they're, they're not seeking them and searching them out. That's the 90%. They'll be here during seals. The other 10% is, is the group that generally believes they've already figured it out. They've already known for a couple hundred years it's going to be a seven-year tribulation. They already know pre-trib, and yet others within that will say, no, it's not pre-trib, it's mid-trib. And then others will say, both of you guys are wrong. It's not till the Lord returns post-trip. And so when we try to then approach that group, that group can even be harder. That's why they all come against us on other YouTube channels and delete any comments or anything about Ministry Revealed because if they take the time, and that's we're not trying to argue with them. We're not trying to have big, mysterious conversations. We just want to have a study with them and, and have a little back and forth and say, look at these differences in the Gospels. If that's where we start, if they, were, if they would be willing to take some time to do that, their whole paradigm would shift. Because once you see it and once you understand it, you can't turn away from it. Once you see it and you know it, and things start to now make sense and they line up and you say, well, wait a second. Yeah, that makes sense. Why... Can every position of pre, mid, and post argue their position with Scripture, yet I'm here saying it's only pre, and the other one's over here saying it's only mid, and the other one's over here saying post, and they can all stand on it with Scripture? We have three synoptic Gospels all giving a different storyline. Last will be first. The first will be last. We see the colors of the robes. We see the, the words on the cross. We, we see the coming in the cloud, in the clouds, on the clouds. And you realize, well, wait a second. Maybe there is something to this. And so it's, it, it's, it's not a, an easy task, but that's why I think, you know, things like platforms like YouTube really, really help us out. And, um, you know, we can reach people around the world that we've never, ever, ever would have reached. And um, it, it, only the spirit can lead. That's probably the other piece of it, right? Is I don't go around hammering people on the head over and over and over again. Hey, you got to listen. You got to listen. I've learned my lesson with that. You know, you, you get punched down so many times. You're just like, all right, I, I get it. We can share it. And the rest, we leave it for the spirit to lead them. And so, you know, I, I've settled in the last year and a half or so. Um, instead of getting in in debates with, you know, things like this topic, right? Nobody knows the day or hour. So in doing it in a, in a live show or doing it in a teaching, whether here or in Ministry Revealed or even going on other channels, when that, <laughs> when that happens, um, you know, it, it's a great way to reach more and really help people see and understand because once 
you begin to realize these things and it starts to open up, just like I said in the beginning, you start digging in deeper into his word. You see, if everybody's going around saying nobody knows the day or hour, what happens, Michael? What happened with you, Michael, when you were a part of the church believing nobody knows the day or hour? Were you were you seeking the Lord in prophecy and trying to understand him in his is to come? No, uh, actually, I re I relied on the pastors uh, because I trusted them because they're mo most of them were theologians. They came from a Bible school, and uh, I just trusted their word that no one knows the day and the hour. So, okay, why I bother? Why should I bother reading? You know, Revelation. Why should I look for the prophecy if no one knows the day and the hour? So that's what happened to me after I was stuck. So, yeah, for years I was like that. Why would I bother uh, reading the prophecies and understanding the prophecies of what's really happening um, when no one knows the day and the hour that Jesus Christ, you know, will, will come? But uh, based on my understanding, uh, reading, and then uh, watching and listening to you and to others, we can know the hours and, the, you know, we can understand the day and the hour uh, there's a, like what I've said in the beginning, uh, the introduction that uh, there are numerous examples in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, where, you know, the great heroes of the Bible found out the day that they will be redeemed, that they will be, uh, you know, redemption. So, yeah, so that right. was uh, my journey. And now I, I would truly say that I understand so much because I, 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 I'm able now to dig deeper and then understand the feast of the Lord because that's all connected to, uh, you know, His coming. Right. Anyway, yeah, that's my experience, Brother Alan. Yeah, and, and that's really it, isn't it? It's, you know, as you begin to understand these things, then you start seeking and searching. So what does, what does this, this topic do to people that are told nobody knows the day or hour? Don't bother looking. Most of them don't bother to look. Are there some? Yeah, there's some. <laughs> this is this is it's funny, and I'm I'm not doing this to pick on anybody because I was the same. But you have a whole millions of people running around saying nobody knows the day or hour, and then you've got a bunch of people on YouTube trying to tell you when the day and hour is. You see how strange that is? They will tell you nobody knows the day or hour. And then they put out video after video after video trying to explain why this is that day or that hour. And I, for a long time, that used to confuse me. It was just, I accepted like you would, Michael, that nobody knows the day or hour. And it was just at that. But I was into prophecy, so I was still trying to discern and trying to understand some things before I started getting the understanding. And I was still confused like everybody else. I was believing the seven years. And then we're, and I was still listening to people who were talking about not knowing the day and hour, yet we're trying to say there was a date here and a date there and a date there. You know, it's, it's such a, a contradictory, a contradiction to be able to say nobody knows the day or hour and then put out video after video trying to say when the day and hour is. You know, it's, and this type of contradiction is is what's happening in the church in particular with prophecy let me let me give you one example we're not we're, we're kind of getting going into it but in a, in a different roundabout way not that i not as i had planned but that's okay i like this with live shows you see this is one of those things this is why when we talk about the 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 differences now you can see my screen right yes we can see michael can you see Yes, we can. You can see, see uh, I'm in Matthew 24. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. So this is why the, the differences in the Gospels are so important. When you have people that read from Matthew 24, which is 100% of church prophecy, from this one passage, which is Matthew 24, going into 25, you have people saying it's pre, you have people saying it's mid, and you have people saying it's post. Now, do they all get it because of what they read here? No, but some of them do. Some of them believe 
that when you read the coming of the Son of Man and it talks about him coming in the clouds, they think this is pre-trib. It's, it's like they speed read over immediately after the tribulation of those days in verse 29. They don't use a program, say, like this, which is called Esword, to realize that it says this is when he's coming not in, but actually the word on. You know, that's, that's something that always makes me scratch my head. If it was supposed to be on, why didn't they use the word on? And if it was on, then I would think everybody who reads this wouldn't actually be saying this is a picture of the Lord coming pre-trip. Nor should they be saying it when it says immediately after the tribulation of those days. And what else do people do? This is where 99% of them come to say, but of that day and hour knows no man. This is where they come. And what do they talk about now? What do they always talk about? That it would be as it was in the days of Noah. They all go to Matthew chapter 24. Because what haven't they realized? Well, first of all, either they haven't realized or they've skipped over it so often that it's, it's not even part of the vocabulary that verse 29 starts with immediately after the tribulation of those days. And because they don't know that the word in here actually means on the clouds. Because if they did, they would realize this is absolutely post-trib. And they wouldn't be going to it all the time. This is the power of the revelation of the Gospels, which is why it was the first thing I was led to understand in 2017. And then when you do that, and you understand that the days of Noah is truly a relation to after the Lord comes, feet down on the clouds, feet down on the Mount of Olives, you come to realize that this day and hour that no one knows is the final year of tribulation, which is like Noah's final year. No, I mean, Noah's year, which was one year and 10 days long, which is exactly what happens, as we've taught here in a few videos on Ministry Revealed, that the final year of tribulation, whether somebody believes a tribulation is seven years or whether you understand the truth that it's 14 years, that final seventh year is the final seventh year of the seven times seven years of 49 years. Because that final, then when that final seven is done, it's the Jubilee. And the Jubilee has 10 days into the new year. 10 days into the new year on the Day of Atonement is when the trumpet is blasted on uh, uh, declaring the final jubilee, declaring the jubilee and the restoration of all things and then receiving their land. That's how, when people understand that, and most prophecy teachers don't even understand that, that the final year of tribulation has to be followed then by the jubilee. So when you hear people even talking a little bit now that, oh, we're in a jubilee now or we're in a jubilee next year, or, we were in a jubilee two years ago. It's absolutely impossible. Are there jubilees along the way, you know, when the queen came or, or when Israel became a nation or, you know, are there 50 year events throughout history? Yes, I'm 51. Mine was last year. So I had a jubilee. That, but is it the jubilee? No, it's not the biblical jubilee because the biblical jubilee has to happen at the end of the final year. But that final year, which is a day and hour no one knows when it starts, is going to be as it was in the days of Noah. And when we go to Noah's scripture, which is Genesis 7 to 8, we see that it started on the second month, 17th day, and it ended one year later on the second month, 27th day, a year and 10 days long. Which means if it started on the day and hour no one knows, it's going to end on a day and hour no one knows, but plus 10 days. And on the 10th day, when that 10th day comes, it's going to be a shofar blast, right? It's going to be, listen to this. I'm kind of starting at the end, but I'm going to prove it all out as I go back to the beginning and then bring it back through. Seven times seven years, 49 years in Leviticus 25, then verse 9, then shall thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound, listen to this, on the 10th day of the seventh month, 
which is the Day of Atonement. Which means if the Jubilee begins 10 days after the day and hour no one knows, what's the day and hour no one knows? Clearly, the Feast of Trumpets. You see? And that is what has caused people so much confusion if they understood these little mysteries. And, you know, it's funny because some of these things, as I look back on them, seemed so obvious. Yet, until you spend the time digging into Scripture and seeking and searching His Word and really digging in, even for somebody who is a seven-year tribber, anybody who is even a seven-year, they should understand this right here. Everybody knows that does a little bit of scripture study or that talks on prophecy. Everybody knows that it's seven times seven years and then it's the Jubilee. They all know it. But what the vast majority, in fact, I've heard nobody that I can think of over the years, not that there isn't, but I haven't heard anybody realize that the end of the seven years of tribulation, then brings about the jubilee and if the jubilee comes on the 10th day of the seventh month of atonement which is precisely what we read from the story of noah when it ends on the second month's 27th day which is 10 days longer than it started and it's in matthew chapter 24 that said immediately after the tribulation of those days that that said, when, when you understand what the wording is and you realize that it's on the clouds, then you see that it's the day and hour no one knows and it's the start of Noah's story. It becomes so clear. So what you come to find out from this with Matthew 24 is everybody who talks on Matthew 24 and says the coming of the Lord in Matthew 24 is not pre, is not mid, but it's post-trib. Those people are all, those are the ones who are correct. They're the ones who are right. But unfortunately, what happens is then they dismiss the people who talk about pre and show scripture on it. They dismiss the people that talk on mid and show scripture about it. But they're absolutely right in saying Matthew 24 is post. You see, and, and everybody else trying to use this to say mid and pre they're wrong. But does that mean mid and pre aren't true? No. It simply means they haven't understood the revelation of the, of the Gospels. And when you do understand the revelation, man, does everything start to open up. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's like you said, especially with this topic of nobody knows the day or hour. That let's... Um, you know, we've talked about whether it be Genesis and talking about Enoch, right? Enoch never tasted of death. And why didn't Enoch taste of death? Enoch never tasted of death uh, He was because he was translated, because he had a testimony that he pleased God. And then we're told that without faith, it's impossible to please him. So first of all, you can try to please God by doing a bunch of good things, you know, feeding the, the poor and helping the homeless and doing all these things. But if you don't first have faith, do you realize he doesn't recognize anything you're doing? So all, all as an example, you know, a, a retired lady and she's helping the homeless doing all these things. Do you think the Lord is going to give her credit for that in rewards if she doesn't believe in Jesus? Or does he not even recognize it? He doesn't even recognize it. It means it means nothing to him. To humans, it's oh, what a great little old lady or or a great lady. But if she didn't have faith, it's nothing to the father. So obviously, faith comes first. Then you could please him. And in this pleasing him, how did Enoch please him? Right? He was diligently seeking. He believed that God was a rewarder. Of those who diligently sought him. And in the prophecy world, what does everybody want to be? They want to be like Enoch. 
They want to be like Enoch that never tasted of death. They all talk about it. Yet nobody recognizes it. Or I shouldn't say nobody. Few people recognize what's actually going on. You see, they'll argue with you that oh, all you have to do is have faith. Well, no, you have to have faith and then you have to please them. How do you please them? You diligently seek them. So it's not just about, you know, oh, I have faith and now everybody's saved. We, we've understood that, right? We've taught on these things before as well. What else do we have? We have, of course, like you were talking about with Elijah and Elisha. Elijah knew when he was going. He knew the time frame. He was crossing over and the Lord take, took him up. Elijah gets a second por a double portion, and there goes Elijah in a whirlwind into heaven. So it's it's not like that there's no um history of not being able to understand these things. That that people at certain points we have examples. And when you talk to somebody, again, when it comes to a seven year person, which is just about everybody outside of us out there over there, is they will do the same thing where they will put Noah and Elijah in the same breath. Like they're both the same example of quote unquote pre-trip. But we've been able to reveal from the differences in the Gospels that Enoch is the pre-trib picture and Elijah is the mid-trib picture. Those that will still be alive that will make it to mid-trib. And it's this was a big deal for me back in the early days, just as the Revelation was coming about, because when you go to Revelation 6, you go to the end of it, and it's the end of the sixth seal. Then you read about the great multitude, which is the rapture, in Revelation chapter 7, which is the mid-trib great multitude rapture. You go to Revelation chapter 8, and then you see the seventh seal. You got to say to yourself, well, wait a second. I thought, the, I thought it, it was pre-trib. This was one of the reasons for myself that I used to bounce between mid-trib and pre-trib because clearly it's after the sixth and before the seventh seal. So that's clearly a mid-trib. Yet you'll still have people try to take chapter seven and tell you that it's pre-trib. And you know what the majority of the people do when they say that this is actually the pre-trib is you'll have mid-tribbers this this it's it gets it gets so wild when you understand all of these all of these twisted up mashed up confused ways of thinking is you'll have people that are really essentially mid tribbers who believe that revelation chapter 7 is pre trib and that think all of the seals have already happened except for the 6th seal and that when the sixth seal happens, that's going to be the beginning of tribulation. And this is the Lord coming for his pre-trib group. And then what's he going to do? Seal the 144,000. You ever hear people? I haven't heard it much in a while, but I don't spend too much time watching other channels except for clips that people send me. And But I'm sure it's still out there. You ever have people tell you, that the 144,000 are being sealed first and then it's the, and, and then the great multitude rapture? People talk about that all the time. They're always talking about this remnant worker group of the 144,000 from chapter 7. For, for them to think that, and then they turn around and they go back into Revelation 6 and say, the four horsemen are then coming. What? Wait, wait. Wait a second. You got one group thinking the seals are almost done and we're just waiting on the sixth seal. Then the 144 will be sealed. Then the great multitude rapture, and that's pre trip. Then you've got others saying the Lord is going to seal the 144. There's going to be the great multitude rapture, and then the seals are going to start. What? One, one is bouncing from mid and going back to the beginning. One is skipping all of the beginning and saying we're, we're at the middle. And all you're seeing is just a whole flood of confusion as people are trying to discern where pre is, where mid is, but even more than that, not trying to discern where, but just what scriptures are actually relating to pre, 
to defend their point or what scriptures are relating to mid to defend their point. It's just like going to, um, let's go to a famous one. I'm a little bit off topic, but not really. You'll see. I'll, I'll jump back into it. One of the other ones is, of course, the the resurrection of the dead, right? The quickened, um, whether in the body or out of the body. Uh, sorry, there's a natural body and a spiritual body. And we come down here, uh, flesh and blood cannot bear the kingdom. And then here it says right here, in 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. How often have you guys heard that? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. How many of you have heard this as being the pre-trip? Everybody. Everybody talks about this as being pre-trip. It's like it's like they read through this without paying attention to what they're reading to. Just like immediately after the tribulation of those days. What does it say? At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. So why are they associating this, pre-tribbers, to being a pre-trip? Because they go to Matthew chapter 24... And in the same place of the coming of the Son of Man, which they think is pre because they, they eliminate reading the rest of the story, what do they see? It says in verse 31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall to gather together the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven unto the other. And so all you're seeing is confusion and confusion and confusion. It's prophecy has always been so confusing. But Daniel told us, the Lord told Daniel that the book was sealed until the time of the end. And I believe we've been blessed with the open book. That we've been, we've been blessed to be able to, to see through these mysteries and understand them. So when we go to something like this, like, uh, whoops, like Luke chapter 21, we see this very important wording for pre-tribbers. And do you get pre-tribbers going to this to make a point? Yes, you do. Okay? You'll often have them go to, to Luke 21, 36, and they'll say, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, because they don't understand that Luke, Mark, and Matthew are speaking to different periods of time, they, they tie this in to Matthew's portion of seven years of trumpets. They don't know that, though. But they tie it into Matthew's seven years. And they'll say, see, this is the Lord coming in Matthew 24. And we're going to escape all these things. This is the pre-trip. Well, they're right. But here they are, you see. They're connecting something with pre-trib because they're seeing it somewhere else outside of Matthew, thinking pre-trib. And so because they all learned from Matthew, they're tying it into Matthew even though Matthew is post-trib, and then they turn around and go to Revelation chapter 7 to say the 144 will be sealed and we're going to be taken out of here, and now they're going to mid-trib. And we, we, we try to ask ourselves, you know, or, or they want to come against us, and they, they want to say, no, no, it's seven years, and here's why. When you understand the truth of the revelation of the Gospels, this is the power that's in it. And the power that's in it wasn't about just coming to understand when it was going to take place. Because why? Well, we should always be watching and praying. We're always to be ready. We're always to be diligently seeking the Lord. But if you're always being told that nobody knows the day or hour, that causes a lot of people to just not bother searching. So if nobody knows the day or hour, like Michael was told, Michael would spend less time to no time, trying to understand prophecy, which we're told to understand. The Word of God is it, the spirit of prophecy. And so, you know, you, you end up setting all of that stuff aside because you think, well, if, if nobody can know it and everybody's confused as to, to what's taking place in it, well, all right, I'll just stick with the is and just what I'm being taught and told and I'll just live a good life according to Christ. Is there anything wrong with that? No. But to be like Enoch, 
you need to be diligently seeking him. You see, it's important. It's important to be diligently seeking him. And in the blessing of knowing the differences within the Gospels, let's have a look at this wording. In Luke 21, actually, let's start in verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged, uh, be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. See, because the whole world this time is going to be caught off guard for it. And what does it say? Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Look at this. There's no day and hour. Luke's story is completely different. And most people have understood that Luke's discourse is very different than Mark and Matthew's. But they haven't realized how different Mark's is than Matthew's. And they, so they, have, they, they still match them, all three of them, into the same storyline. We know this is the above. Mark's is the seven years of seals. Matthew's is the seven years of trumpets. So when we come to Luke's and we see that there's nothing about a day and hour, but there's something about a day that's going to catch the world unawares. But if you're paying attention, if you're watching, you should be caught awares of this day if you're what? Watching. If you go to Mark's discourse, this gets really fantastic because this is the revelation of the day and hour. Because when you come to Mark's discourse and you understand that it's the seven years of seals, and you come to the coming of the Son of Man, and you see that the storyline is, is spoken of differently, then what happens? Okay? First of all, there you go. You see that? No trumpet. And when you come down to Mark 13, 32, you see, but of that day and hour. And we see, as we said, this is a different discussion of the coming of the Son of Man. Because Matthew said on... And what does Mark say? The word in is a different word. See, this is the one in Matthew, 1909, and it means on. The one in Mark is 1722, and it does mean in. So just, <clears throat> just in that revelation alone, in seeing that the word in in Mark means in, and the word in in Matthew means on, that one simple revelation right there, that one simple piece of understanding should begin to cause everybody that studies Scripture to pause and look deeper. Just that one little thing. So when you understand that that's what Matthew says, that this is what Mark says, and then you come down to the day and hour no one knows, you got, it causes people to say, what? well, this is just the same story as Matthew's. It's just the day and hour, and we're just being given a, a little bit different type of storyline because Matthews is just giving us another portion of the story because it'll be as it was in the days of, of Noah. But Marx doesn't say that. So they can combine it together and say, well, this will be part of it with that of days of Noah. But, but that said, it's coming of the Lord, and, it, and you understand that it's post now. If you understand that it's post because he's coming on the clouds and everybody knows he's coming on the clouds post-trib, you have to ask yourself, well, what, what's the rest of the differences going on in Mark? Because if this one, it's him coming in the clouds, is it, another, is it another picture of him coming? And the answer is yes. And we do see watch, but you're not seeing the same thing. We'll get to those watches. So you've got a nobody knows the day or hour in Matthew. You've got a nobody knows the day or hour in Mark. Do you know the nobody knows the day or hour? If you go to Matthew 25, we're going to cover all of these. But if you go to Matthew 25, do you know it says it again? Watch this. Matthew 25, 13. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Well, wait a second. It was at the end of Matthew 24 and talking about as it would be in the days of Noah. And then you've got it again 
in Matthew 25, which would be after the days of Noah, meaning the one year, and then there's 10 days. So why would it also be here? Because you don't have it back to back in Mark's, because in Mark's gospel, uh, in chapter 13, Mark's discourse is only chapter 13. Luke's discourse is only chapter 21. But Matthew's discourse is 24 and 25. And you had one at the coming of the Lord on the clouds, being the day and hour no one knows. You had as it was in the days of Noah. And then you have no one knows the day or hour again. So this day and hour is starting to creep up quite a bit more, but not in Luke's. And when we come to Luke's again, we're going to see, and I'll put it now all together in order, we see, watch ye therefore and pray always. So when somebody says, ah, oh, nobody knows the day or the hour, nobody, it discourages people from watching. And sometimes, you know, especially uh, um, new people, they when when they're told to watch, sometimes they think they have to stay up all night and, you know, just, I don't know what they're watching for, but watching is to be to be aware of what's going on even globally to be paying attention to some of this stuff but it's also to be watching to be in his word so if you're watching what does this word watch mean sleepless that is wake up right watch this is why some people who are junior and it will say oh see uh, i can't be sleeping you know i always want to be awake and the the people end up really exhausted right it's kind of funny but not right so where does this word that comes up four times show up? We find it in Mark 13, 33. There it is in Luke 21. Ephesians. Let's look at it in Ephesians first. Chapter 6, verse 18. Let's go to verse, start in verse 10. Uh, Ephesians 6. And we'll start in verse 10. Finally, my brethren. Now he's speaking to the brethren. You see, part of the understanding of this, and I don't want to make it too complicated, but we know it's not just about pre, mid, and post. There's pre, and there's a remnant group chosen to work. There's mid, and there's a remnant group, the 144, chosen to work. And then there's post, and then there's a group that works during the millennial reign. This is that, that pre-work brethren. Okay, He's talking to a remnant group of workers as well. But it's in that time frame of the pre. So he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, stand therefore, having your loins girt about. We know what this means. So in, in our daily life, this is the way we're supposed to be living with the Lord. But at the same time, he's speaking to a group of people who are going out for the Lord. And prophetically, we know that this means a remnant group from the pre-trib that's chosen to remain. So having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and there it is watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints okay now this one piece right here with the loins being girt about we know that this is speaking to a remnant worker but we're still living in the is so when you understand there's a was which was creation to christ there's the is, which is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib. And then the is to come is the pre-trib 
until the end. We can see this as, yes, this is how we're to live our lives and when we're going out for the Lord and doing things uh, for the saints and to wake people up. But you can clearly see the is to come of it by having your loins gird about and doing what? Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication. Why? For all the saints. For all the saints. You see what's happening here? He's not talking to all the saints. He's not talking to the whole church. He's talking to a group of people who are going about, watching over and doing these things, going out for all the saints. So we can apply this in the people going out for the Lord now and bringing people to salvation. And in the prophetic, we know it's the saints during the time of seals that we see in Revelation 13 and so forth. So, Again, we're having this watch or watching, which is the same word, and it's the one connected to the pre group. There's because that pre group is the one watching. They're the one diligent. They're the ones that go, and a portion of them remain to work, and they'll be the ones in this watching being protected and girded about with all these things in the word for the saints. And that's the is to come typology as well. In verse 19, it says, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, listen to this, to make known the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel. How would this apply in the is to come that we know about, that we were just discussing with this remnant group remaining? They're the ones that will know the mystery. Remember what the mystery is? The mystery is in Romans 16, Again, with the Priscilla's and the Aquilas, for those who have been around for a while, the Priscilla's and Aquilas, who are prophetic type of workers, and we see in verse uh, Romans sixteen twenty five, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Wait a second. What, what is this? In the is, we know it's Christ. In the is to come, what is it? It's the mystery of the revelation which was kept secret, which is what? Something that now is, made, is going to be made known to all nations, and it was for who? Those who were obedient and faithful. Who's that? It was the mystery of the pre-trip. You see, the, the biggest mystery is actually the pre-trip. It's not the mid-trip. Because the mid-trip is clearly written for us right there in Revelation chapter 7. The post-trip is clearly written because we know it's when the Lord returns feet down. The pre-trip is the biggest secret. That's the, that's the mystery in relation to this, not in the is of Christ, but in the is to come. And we know that there's a group even being kept secret till the time of the end. We saw that in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, this same group that we're talking about that is part of the pre who are being what? Who were kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the end of days. So all of this is connected to this period of time of Luke 21, where it says to watch. It's this pre-trib group who are going to be accounted worthy to escape all these things, yet at the same time, a group from among them who are going to continue this watch who are a group hidden for the time of the end, from a group that was part of the mystery that's going to be made known to the whole earth. But none of it is connected to a day and hour. It's connected to a day that will come on the world unawares, but not those who are faithful and diligent in the Lord, like an Enoch. So let's see where this leads by seeing where else it's found we see Ephesians 
speaking to the same group of the portion being chosen to remain from them, from Luke 21, 36. And the other place we see is in Mark 13. Check this out. Why would this remnant watch group chosen from among those that went pre-trib, which, by the way, we could see in Luke's wedding story, as a little side note, we see the it starts with a wedding feast, and then there's a banquet. We've talked on these things before. And what do we see? Those who are part of the resurrection of the just, they're the same ones as these workers that we're talking about. And who are the ones gone to the wedding feast? That's the pre-trib group. That's the pre-trib group. This is the remnant workers. They're, they're part of the same group, but this group was chosen to remain. They're part of those that we're going to continue to watch and are going to do it for the saints during the time of seals. So we're seeing, in this, we're seeing the connection of Luke 21 to Ephesians 6 and what it said about those watching. So why would it then also be in Mark chapter 13? In Mark chapter 13, verse 33, we know this is what? But of that day and hour knows no man. Why is it a day and hour knows no man? Because once, and what we're going to get to it, but when you realize what it is, as I, as I was already touching on with, with the revelation of the seventh year of tribulation, or the, the final year, I should say, the 14th year, the final year of tribulation, when you understand that what follows is 10 days later, is is on atonement the sh blowing of the shofar and if you take it back you'll see that it's day and hour no one knows because it's 10 days later so what's what was the 10 days before it was feast of trumpets and if you take that all the way back to the beginning of the tribulation you're going to see that the day and hour day and hour and all this repetition of the day and hour because of where the tribulation is starting so when we come here we're seeing the day and hour no one knows. Then look at what it says to Mark's group. In Mark 13, 33, take ye heed, watch. There it is. There's the fourth time. Watch and pray. Listen to this. For you know not when time is. You know not when the time is. It's not about all of the day and hour. It's about the hour so he's coming on a day and hour no one knows but he's having a conversation here with who is he having this conversation with with the the mid-trib people is this conversation about the day and hour no one knows is it about the people going mid-trib because we're at the end of mark's discourse you see what came before it here comes the Son of Man. And this is when he's in the clouds. We know that this is at the end of the sixth year of seals. And when you do this, and you're seeing that it's a day and hour no one knows, but he's talking to a group of people, who is this group that he's talking to? It's not the mid-trib great multitude rapture group. Because listen to what it says next. For the Son of Man is taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants. To his servants. He's talking about the authority that he gave to his servants. Not that he gave to the saints. The saints is the, are the mid-trib great multitude rapture. Some will die during seals. Some will be alive still at the end and go up like Elijah. But he's talking about this conversation to his servants. And he gave to the porter of the house. Watch ye therefore, and listen to this. This is how we know for this group, he's not talking about, you know, not understanding the day and hour. Because in verse 35, talking to his servants who he had left in charge during seals, which we see from Luke, it says, watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, listen to this, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, 
or in the morning? Does that sound like a day, an hour? Is it really talking about an hour? Is it is it really talking about uh, um, a time, as he said here? It's talking about a time of day. Even though up here it said day and hour. Why would you have a day and hour no one knows, and then the rest of it really just talking about a time connected to that day and hour? And then we're seeing different watches. So here we see the uh, verse 33. Where is it? I didn't have it highlighted in the right color. When we see this watch, we know that it's connected to the same one with Luke. It's connected to the same group of people who are his chosen servants from Luke that were working during seals. It's connected to when he's coming on the day and hour no one knows. And from this, realizing the time, it would suggest that this group understands the time. Because what is the time? It's going to be the day and hour no one knows. Which this group of servants will have understood. Kind of interesting. A group of servants who are being prepared ahead of time who might understand these things before they begin. And then he says in verse 37, and what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. But look at this watch. 1127, 1127, and I think there was another one as well. But at least two, there might have been three. That's a different type of watching now at this point. Okay? To be vigilant, to be uh, vigilant, to be awake, to be watching. But now it's different than this watch that he's having this conversation with to his remnant group of workers, his servants. So we're seeing here Luke's connection. Luke is pre, a group chosen to remain and watch. We know who they are in the same watching word who are going to be doing it and working for the supplication for all saints. And we know that Mark goes to the end of six year of seals and this conversation that a group is taken and a group remains from them Here's the work and to be ready and prepared and breastplate and everything to go out and do these things for all the saints during seals. And here's the time at the end of seals. And at the end of seals, at the end of the sixth year of seals, which we know it is, we're told that it's a day and hour no one knows and that this watching is because they wouldn't know exactly what time, which tells us what? They probably know or understand, have the knowing, the understanding of the day and hour that no one knows. So let's look now at this word for watch. The 11, this next one, the 1127. And this gets really, really interesting here now as well. Because for one, we know it's connected to that group of workers from SEALs, from the Luke group. And we know that that connection comes from this watch. But then we also see the next watch, not knowing the exact time when it's coming, and to be ready and watching, just, you know, don't be sleeping and be watching. So when we see where we find this watch, look what happens. We see it in Luke 12, 37 and 39. Let's go back into Luke chapter 12. Verse 37 and 39. Well, look at this. 35 starts with, let your loins be girded about. You seeing a pattern here? There's a group of people watching. There's a group of people diligently watching, preparing, who will, who will be chosen to remain and to work from the Luke group, who are part of those watchmen, where everybody's telling you, nobody knows the day or hour, and it throws people off so they don't bother watching. And there's another group of watchmen who are watching. Yet there's a whole group of them that don't understand that this day and hour that they proclaim, no one knows, and they're trying to point to every single day of the week because they haven't understood it. He's talking to his servants in this time of the is to come. Listen to what it says. We know this one very well, right? Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding 
that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Now, again, if you've been following Ministry Revealed, you know this is, again, that Luke remnant worker, those servants. You see, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself, uh, gird himself and make them to sit down and meet and serve them. Now we got a different watching here. But this watching is the same as what? It's the same as the one at the end of Mark. Uh, at the end of Mark, it had both. The end of Mark had both watches, both versions of the word for watch, because it's connected to the servants of the Luke watching group. And we come down to verse, what is it, verse thirty-nine? And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched. So there it, there it is again here in Luke. So what's he talking about? If he'd have known what time the thief would have come, he would have watched. Well, let's go back to Mark. In Mark chapter 13, what do we see the story of the day and hour no one knows? We come to verse 34. The Son of Man is taking a far journey left his house and gave authority to his servants. What did he leave? He left his house. He gave the authority to his servants and to every man uh, his work and commanded the porter to, huh, that other watch. That same other watch connected to the pre-trib group and connected to the watching when he comes at the end of seals. We're seeing watch, 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 watch. Everybody's telling you not to watch because nobody can know the day and hour. Watch, watch, watch. We go to, when you, when you keep digging into this, we've done videos on this on Ministry Revealed as well in relation to the wording that's found here. This first group of remnant workers, and we see here in verse 38 that it says, uh, and, if, uh, and, if in the, and if he shall come, sorry, in the second watch, now this is about a, a guarding watch, right? This is a different type of watch. If he come in the second watch or come in the third watch. Remember I told you at the beginning, when you understand Luke, Mark, and Matthew pre-mid post, you understand from all three of those groups, a portion is being taken out to remain and to work for the next group. So the first group was that watch from Luke. They're going to work during Mark's time, during seals. Then when the seal's great multitude rapture is about to come in, the 144,000 are the second watch. They're going to work during the time of trumpets. And at the end of trumpets, when that's done and the Lord has come, then the third watch is going to go out. And that's the group that's going to remain to work during the millennial reign, going out no longer preaching, but only teaching, as it says in Matthew 28. These are the three watches. Well, wait a second. You see what happens if people understand what's going on here? It's showing you pre, mid, and post. There's three watches to three times of his coming. Pre, mid, and post. And when you keep reading this, we see this one here in verse 39. It, that, as we just said, that uh, in this know that if the good man of the house had known at what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched. What hour? So in Mark's, we're reading about day and hour, but when he's talking to his servants that he gave charge over his house, he, it's like it's not a mystery for them. It's, it's like they're, they're not aware that day and hour understanding is a mystery. It's like they know what it is. And so to just be watching for that time, you don't know if it's at the cock crowing, at midday, at noon, whatever it might be. But you know that it's at hand. He's talking to his servants. And then... We keep going on. Uh, listen, as it goes further, and then it says, uh, I think verse, starting in verse 44, of a truth I say unto you, he will make him ruler over all that he has. Verse 45, but and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunk, drunken, the Lord of that servant 
will come in a day when he looketh not for him and at an hour when he's not aware. He's going to come at a day and an hour when a disobedient servant who's gone off to beat the, the others and other servants, men, servants, and maidens, and start drinking, he's not going to be aware of the coming day and hour. He's going to be cut asunder and will appoint his portion with the unbelievers. So you're seeing this other group. So if we saw that the, the first group chosen, be girded about, they're working during seals, and then we're seeing the, the information about that group being watchmen and the hour within it and coming as a thief, listen to what it says. Again, had known what hour the thief would come, they would have watched. Well, when we go to Matthews, do we get this one? No, that was Mark's. But what do we read after is the same thing we read in Matthews. Watch this. I think starting in verse, verse 42. Matthew 24, verse 42. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour. You see, again, why is it saying what hour? Because the watchmen know what the day and hour means. They just don't know the exact time it's going to happen. But they know it means a specific thing. And we're going to talk about that still. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known which, uh, uh, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready for such an hour you think not, the Son of Man cometh, who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord shall make him ruler over his household and give him meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all of his goods, but and if. Huh. Sounds similar? Sounds identical, doesn't it, to what we were just reading in Luke 12, that, that second watch group, that group of 144, that worked during trumpets, and this is the time when the Lord comes at the day and hour no one knows at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, which is the end of 13 years of tribulation. This is the time that what? That it begins as it was in the days of Noah. This is that final year of tribulation. And the warning is, but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and begins to smite his fellow servants and drink and be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come at a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour when he's not aware. So the people that aren't watching and aren't praying and aren't diligent, we, we definitely see this in the is to come in relation to the workers, but if you're reading it in the is, what should you be doing? Well, if you're watching and praying, you should be aware of a time frame, you should be aware and shouldn't be caught off guard by days and hours, by a day and an hour when these things are coming. So what does that mean? Well, you have to be diligent. Does everybody out there who is diligent in the Lord know the day or hour? No, but they're being diligent in the Lord so that when the Lord comes, they'll be ready regardless. The, the, the fellows, the, the servants of the Lord living in the is, like those who are in Christ, if they say, oh, he's delaying his coming, it's taking too long, I'm, I'm going to go do this and I'm going to do that, and you know it's going to be coming maybe in several months or in a few years, I'll come back then. That's how you could apply that in the is right now as well. But this being in Matthew 24, we know this is all truly related to is to come. But again, you know, I don't want it to get too too confusing with because I know I'm bouncing around, but how could everybody keep saying day and hour? What do they they don't even understand what they're saying? Because day and hour has nothing to do with pre-trib, it has nothing to do with, with the mid-trib rapture. It has nothing to do with the pre-trib rapture it has nothing to do with the mid-trib rapture and it does have to do with the coming of the lord 
at mid-trib. It does have to do with the coming of the Lord feet down on the Mount of Olives post-trib. But in neither of all three, well, in the two of Mark and Matthew, none of those places does it have to do with a taking of people at any point. Because this day and hour isn't when the Lord is going to gather himself, everybody to himself when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives on the clouds. He still has to cleanse the world for that day of Noah. The day and hour literally has nothing to do with pre, mid, or post. It's the time of his coming. His comings, I should say. And at these times of his comings is related to conversations he's having with his remnant workers for each group. That's the story of what's going on here. And we can see the ones that work during trumpets from chosen from the Mark group, the the 144,000. We could see something happens to one or to some of them where they end up in big trouble and they end up in weeping and gnashing of teeth. But when you understand, it has nothing, zero, to do with pre, mid, and post. Watch this. In in what we were seeing, remember how the the wording in Mark, in Mark 13, it told us the day and hour when he's coming, uh, gave authority to his servants. Was it this one? No, it wasn't this one. I lost my train of thought for a second. Let me get back. We see, even in Be Watchful. So, you know what? Let me, I think I'm going to just jump over that. Give me a second. I want to jump over that piece because I really want to get the focus now and in seeing what is this day and hour all about. You see, the the first part of this is covering all of this stuff about watching. We we see watch, watching, watch. It, it's all over the place. And yet the church tells us because they think the day and hour has to do with pre-trib, they tell us that because nobody knows the day or hour, People get discouraged from even going in to study prophecy. When when you realize how much of Scripture is prophecy, we're definitely supposed to be studying prophecy. And people are discouraged because people tell them things that they don't understand. And because those that are saying it don't understand it, those that are hearing it are believing from those who they think understand it. And then they're being twisted up about it as well. That's why it's a whole mishmash. And we've been so blessed to be able to understand what these things mean. What is it that's being said? And we used to bounce back and forth between this a lot. But it's clear. We all know what it means. It is literally a day of remembrance of blowing or a day of blowing the trumpet. Today, it's called Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. The Feast of Trumpets is the blowing of trumpets. It's literally the day and hour no one knows. So when when you have the world of prophecy in in their seven years and, and Matthew 24 and saying the day and hour no one knows, they should be watching every year at the time of the Feast of Trumpets based on their belief. But without going all reiterating it all, we all know that the confusion of their belief has nothing to do with the day and hour for pre or even mid. So let's cover what this is. Let's cover it. We saw that in Luke's discourse, it said, don't be caught off guard by that day. Nothing about day and hour. We see that it goes in uh, watch ye therefore and pray always to be accounted worthy. Nothing about not knowing a day and hour. Now, 
we've revealed what this means, and it's it's something that has to go much deeper in a study, but we're not going to go into it because we've talked about it a lot on Ministry Revealed. But we know, because of the revelation of the Gospels, that Luke's discourse is a period of 40 days in the above, in the, in the portion called above that's before the 14 years begins. And that revelation came from 2 Corinthians, began in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's Paul, and it's about the events that took place in the is, but it's prophecy laden all throughout. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Like a rapture, like a harpazo goes to the third heaven. And I knew such a man. And I was saying he knew a different type and how this one was caught up and was caught up in a rapture to paradise. And then we see... He says, now the third time, I'm ready to come to you. So we know it's a taking, a taking, and a return. Well, that's what we're seeing in these stories of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. In first watch, second watch, third watch. It's a pre, mid, and post. The first two are takings, and the third one is a return. So when you understand that Luke's discourse is this above portion, and you understand that when the Lord comes at the end of the sixth year of seals, it's a day and hour no one knows, and that when he comes, feet down on the Mount of Olives, it's a day and hour no one knows, what happens? Let's see, how can I show this with... Uh... Oh, here. What happens is if we know that we have 50 days in what Paul called above, and we've broken it down through many scriptures, and Luke's tells us nothing about not knowing the day and hour, and then we have six years of seals of Revelation chapter 6, and we see the Lord coming in the clouds in Mark's discourse, we know that that's the Feast of Trumpets. So he's coming at the end of the sixth year to start the seventh, on the day and hour, no one knows. And when he comes, he's talking to his servants that he gave authority over his household, and they're the ones to be watching, not knowing what hour it's going to happen. And that's the Lord coming in the clouds. But it's still, it's not the pre-trib. This is something we've shown in many, in many situations. It's like going to the end of Revelation 6. And at the end of Revelation 6, the end of the sixth year of seals, there's the Lord coming in the clouds. Hide us from the face of him uh, that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. You go to Revelation 7, and now he's got his second watch group, the 144,000, and then the great multitude rapture. So just in, in following that from the end of the sixth seal into chapter seven, which is between the end of the sixth and before the seventh seal happens, sometime in the seventh year of seals, of the tribulation of seals, is when the great multitude rapture happens. So according to Marx, which we now see, is the Lord coming in the clouds, like the end of Revelation 6, and we see that it's a day and hour no one knows, that means this day and hour that no one knows, that we're seeing the Lord come right here at the end of the 6th, this is the start of the 7th year, he's coming on the Feast of Trumpets. So if he's coming on the Feast of Trumpets, and it was 6 years, and he's starting the 7th at the Feast of Trumpets on the day and hour no one knows, then it's probably safe to say that it starts the 14 years on the day and hour no one knows at the Feast of Trumpets. And what comes before that? The 50 days, which has the pre-trib and those other events that come first. Remember, Luke's discourse said nothing about the day and hour no one knows. So then what happens? Well, that would seem then that the years are being counted from the Feast of Trumpets every single year. 
if we can prove that by showing the end of the sixth year is the Feast of Trumpets because of Mark's group, Mark's discourse, and he's coming at the end of the sixth year on the day and hour no one knows, which is the Feast of Trumpets, then if we go forward and we go to the end of the 13th year of tribulation or the end of the 13th year of trumpets, of trumpet judgments, or the 13th year of tribulation, but the, thir uh, the, the end of the sixth year of trumpet judgments, and we go to Matthew's discourse, we read in Matthew's discourse that, of course, the Son of Man is now coming on the clouds. This is when he's coming as lightning, right? As lightning from one end unto the other. He's coming on the clouds. The whole world will see him. And he again says that it'll be a day and hour that no one knows. So if it's a day and hour no one knows, at the end of Matthew's discourse, to the end of the sixth year of trumpets, to the coming of the Lord, and it's the day and hour no one knows, that means he's going to start the 14th year. He's going to be seen coming at the beginning of the 14th year at the Feast of Trumpets. The day and hour no one knows. Which means what? When this 14th year comes to an end, it's going to be the day and hour no one knows. And when this final year is over, not only is it one year to the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, but then we know there's an additional 10 days because we were told it would be as it was in the days of Noah. So when I was showing you earlier in Matthew 25 that here's the Lord coming. See, they're seeing him coming. Now here he's coming. He's coming. The bridegroom is coming. You have the foolish and the wise virgins. This is now the end of the 14th year. This is the end of that one year of the days of Noah. And what does he tell them? They see him coming. They see him coming. And what does it say? It again says it's the day and hour no one knows. Funny how that happened, right? You didn't see it in Luke. You didn't see it twice in Mark, but you see it twice in Matthew. In the 14th year of Matthew's discourse starts at the Feast of Trumpets, day and hour no one knows, ends on the Feast of Trumpets, day and hour no one knows, and 10 days later is what? The trumpet blast of the Jubilee. You see, the, the biggest mystery in all of this is that most people, even though they speak on it sometimes, they don't stick with the understanding that the day and hour no one knows is the Feast of Trumpets. And so why do, do all or, or so many of the, of the watchmen that are out there who know that the day and hour know, uh, is the Feast of Trumpets, why don't they stick to it? Why don't they stick to no one knows the day or hour? Because every year when the Feast of Trumpets comes, they say, see, the day and hour means the Feast of Trumpets. They all know the day and hour. They'll talk about it. But soon as it passes, they go on to the next event and then go on to the next event and go on to the next event. Why would you do that if your belief is from Matthew 24, the day and hour no one knows, it's going to be as it was in the days of Noah, which you believe is the beginning of tribulation, and that it's the coming of the Son of Man, why wouldn't you stick with no one knows the day or hour? You see, it, it, it's confusion. It's, I think a lot of people, it's because they just want it to be the next thing. They're, they wanted to see the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So even though this is what their belief is, they don't stick with it because they're hopeful it might be something else. The good news is, is it is something else because where they get their understanding from is wrong. It's post. So did you see what was happening? When, when you go into the picture of it, if the end of the 14th year in Matthew 25, after the days of Noah, is the day and hour no one knows, and then it's 10 days to the Jubilee blast like we saw in Leviticus, and we saw in Matthew 24 when he's coming on the clouds, 
He tells us that it's a day and hour. No one knows. And it's a feast of trumpets. And we go back seven more years. And at the end of the sixth year of seals in Mark's discourse, he says he's coming in the clouds and it's a day and hour no one knows. When do you think the 14 years are going to begin? Obvious. The day and hour no one knows. So you could say, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. well, wait a second. Maybe then the, the, those people in their seven-year thinking and, and going to Matthew 24 in a roundabout way, then they're right. It's going to be the coming of the Lord at the day and hour no one knows. <laughs> nope. Because Luke's said nothing about the day and hour. Luke's is the portion called above. And the portion called above is what we've revealed. It, it, it is the revelation of the 50 days that come before the 14 years begin. And so if it's 14 years and it the last year starts at the Feast of Trumpets and the 14th year ends at the Feast of Trumpets and 10 days later is the Jubilee, and after six years of seals, the Lord's coming at the Feast of Trumpets, then it's pretty obvious that if the tribulation is 14 years long and 10 days, then it starts the 14 years at the Feast of Trumpets. But what do we know about the 14 years beginning at the Feast of Trumpets? If you go to Mark's discourse, which is the beginning of the 14 years, it starts with, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, the uh, famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. You know what happens when you go to Luke's? For those of you who hadn't seen this before, when you go to Luke's discourse, he gives us very interesting wording. In black letters, it's Luke speaking. Then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, great earthquakes, famines, and so forth. And then in verse 12, he says, but before all these. So before the nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, which is where Mark's discourse begins. Before this begins, this is the period of Luke's discourse. It's the portion called above, and it relates to the 40 days in the 50 when the Lord returns from the wedding, but before all these. So if the 14 years in Mark's discourse begins at nation against nation, when you go to Revelation chapter 6, what is nation against nation? It's the red horse rider. You see, to have nation against nation, peace needs to be taken from the earth so that they could what? Kill one another, and they're going to do it with what? The great sword. Which means the Son of Man, as we've taught, is coming for 40 days in that above portion of 50 after the wedding, and the 14 years after his 40 days and he's gone, and the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes upon those workers, the 14 years will begin with nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and it will start right here on the day and hour no one knows. Because when the six years are over, the seventh year starts the day and hour no one knows. When the 13 years are over, the 14th year starts on the day and hour no one knows. When the 14th year is over, it's the day and hour no one knows, and 10 days later, it's the blast of the trumpet for the jubilee. Hopefully that I didn't confuse too many people. We have plenty of watches. We have plenty of, of, of definitions, of, of understanding of the word. It is so clear, guys, when you understand the differences in the Gospels first and foremost. And you see where the conversations of day and hour are, you understand that it's 100% a feast of trumpets. When you understand that, and you see the pre, the mid, the post, it doesn't matter what anybody wants to tell you about, oh, nobody knows the day or hour, nobody knows the day or hour. I, I even suspect that there are some pastors out there 
that study prophecy, even maybe like in a like I would think somebody like an Amir Safari knows that the day and hour no one knows means feast of trumpets. The only problem is that they apply it in the wrong spot. And as a pastor, if he's out there telling everybody, hey, it's going to be at the day and hour no one knows, which means Feast of Trumpets. We all know Hebrew, and it means Feast of Trumpets. I've studied it. I understand, he says. And he was telling the whole congregation, do you know what would happen? It would also get people to stop watching. A lot of people would stop watching if they knew that the, that the pre-trib was, or if they believed that the pre-trib was connected to the day and hour no one knows. See, it's, it's this catch-22 that happens in, in everything almost. If, if you're telling people, and we can reveal here the time frame that scriptures have revealed, it causes people to pay less attention. So last year, I didn't really want to reveal it, and, but I wasn't going to hide the truth. So I made it known, and then our views dropped by about 1,500, which means a bunch of people are going to go watch others in confusion, or they're just going to go do things in the life and maybe come back if, if they, you know, nobody's guaranteed tomorrow, but they would expect, oh, hopefully I'll come back when the time gets closer. I don't want people to do that, but I can't control it. But if you're a pastor saying, hey, it's connected to the day and hour no one knows. We see it right there in Matthew. And if, if they were adamant in showing that, hey, if nobody knows the day and hour and we know it's Feast of Trumpets, well, then you would have a bunch of people that wouldn't be paying attention to other things in prophecy because they would think, well, I'll come back when it's closer to September, October every year for the time of the Feast of Trumpets. So you end up in this just a twisted mess of mishmash and everything. And we have the clarity. We can see it. We can understand it. And for the past year, instead of keeping the focus always on the when, we, we intertwine it a little bit within the bigger picture of the rest of the revelation that keeps us digging into him, getting more clarity, and drawing closer and closer. Because we've understood what the day and hour means. It's, it's, it's a done deal. We understand it. We know that there's 50 days that come first. The only issue is, is it really going to be this year? And I believe it is. And so when these people as you're sharing, want to come against you and say, oh, nobody knows the day or hour. You just say, you know what it means? Feast of Trumpets. I can show you it means Feast of Trumpets. I, to understand why, start with differences in the Gospels, right? Start with, the, start with something simple like the, the different color of the robes. Start with uh, the definition of the words of Jesus on the cross. And then go into the discourse as your third one. And show them the discourse that it means in a single cloud, in plural clouds, that Matthews is actually on plural clouds. That should get them, that should get their head scratching. And then you can explain that the reason it says day and hour is because Matthews is the coming of the Lord post trib. In Mark's, it is the coming of the Lord mid trib. But at neither point are they about the pre-trib taking of people, the mid-trib taking of people, or the post-trib people coming back. They're all about the coming of the Lord. Get that? It's the coming of the Lord and when things are done. That's what it's all about. See, we've been told forever, haven't we? That it's all it's about pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib. And the reality is, day and hour no one knows is about the Lord telling his servants when he is coming. That's what's going on. That's the story. Probably new to, to many of you, right? Um, I'm sure that those who will watch, um, that'll be a real shocker for them too, to realize that day and hour no one knows is not about a taking, a taking, or return. It's all about the timing of the comings of the Lord and his servants. We had sent over those times to bring in the people for them to be aware of. 
It's pretty wild. All right, Michael. I, I think uh, I was confusing, I, uh, but hopefully there was some clarity for some of you. Oh, wow. That's a great, great uh, explanation, teaching Brother Alan that. But anyway, I'll take this opportunity for every anyone who wants to ask a question. Uh, the microphone is open, but yeah, I have a question, Brother Alan, but I'm giving in, opportunity in the topic, for other. I was going to say, yeah, and you can, uh, the question doesn't have to be just about the, the day and hour. You can, whatever question it is, if, if I okay. have the answer, I'm more than happy to help. Okay, so since no one is uh, ready yet uh, for their question, I have a just a question, Brother uh, uh, Alan. Have you looked into Revelation 3.3? 3? Um, because it says yes. there that, um, you know, he will come as a thief for those who are not watching. I'm just uh, uh, paraphrasing it. But if you can pull the uh, verse... So it says right here, in. Revelation 3, 3, Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Uh, therefore, this says... Uh, therefore. Read. Oh, sorry. Uh, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief. Okay? So what are we seeing here? If therefore thou shalt not watch. So if you're not watching... I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Okay? But for those that are watching, right? This is this is to your point in relation to the video. For those who say, you know, nobody knows the day or hour, and it causes them to not bother watching, here it is in Revelation 3.3, 3, saying, if you're not watching, I'm going to come upon mm -hmm. you as a thief. Now you're going to be in trouble. You see? Yeah. It's so, um, so with with regards to the uh, bride of Christ, to the pre-trib brother Alan, so we know that most of the uh, bride of Christ are watching. I'm just wondering for those, you know, uh, those who will be included. Does it mean that those who will be included in the pre-trib are those that are watching? Is this what the verse is saying? Yeah, not not in not in verse three though. This is going to be oh, okay. about the this. So let me let me show you this because this is a fun one too. When you understand the seven churches of the end of days, which we've revealed, the the conversation within Ephesus is the beginning of the new apostolic age that's going to begin, and mm -hmm. we know that Ephesus is a prophetic picture of the Lord anointing whoever the modern day apostles will be at the beginning of the 50 days. So what, what the seven churches revealed to us in the prophetic is to come, it has been revealed here is it talks about the beginning of the 50 days, the end of the 14 years. And, or you can even say even to mid trumpets, but this goes to the end of 13 to the start of the 14th year. So this is the beginning of the 50 days. When the beginning of the 50 days happens, what's taking place? It's the day of Israel's espousals. You see, I want you guys to know something. I never made this. I got this from a, a website that connected were, uh, um, time frames in the Old Testament mm -hmm. to time frames of the New Testament from Christ until now. Oh from the Old Testament and connected the definitions of words within the seven churches to their time periods. And when I came across it, what they didn't understand, you see, they're showing the is and they're showing was. When I saw this and understood what I did, did about the differences in the Gospels and I started digging into this, it exploded in my mind. And I knew it right away that this, all of this, even though they knew the was and they knew the is, nobody was able to understand the is to come. And we were able to reveal it because even though I didn't type these out, what they did in their depth of study as theologians putting this together is the exact period of revelations in the is to come. So, 
for example, we know the apostles at the moment of the pre-trib, the apostles are going to be anointed and it's going to begin the new apostolic age right off the bat. And when the 50 days begins, and we know that the apostles were breathed on and it's going to start, what's going to be happening in heaven? The wedding. When Jesus returns from the wedding at the end of those seven days, at, in the beginning of the 50, so beginning of the 50, the pre-trib is taken, the apostles are anointed to begin the new apostolic age, and there's a seven-day wedding taking place. The Lord returns at the end of the seven-day wedding, and he starts the 40 days. He's here for 40 days, still in that above portion. <clears throat> He's here for 40 days, and this is when he, he anoints. He's with that Luke remnant group. He's going to meet with them, and then what's going to happen? Well, in the is, it was Roman persecution. It wasn't yet in the wilderness, but it's going to be wanderings. This is the worker group. You got to remember what's going to happen. Tens of millions of people are going to vanish. There's going to be an attack on northern Israel. Things will appear to settle. The Lord is going to be here for 40 days when he returns from the wedding. The group is going to be anointed. The world is going to be in chaos. Remember what Luke 21 said? That the whole world would be caught off guard by the pre-trib. And what's going to happen? These guys, uh, the remnant Smyrna group workers who are here with the Lord for 40 days, going to be following the Lord, learning from him, and persecution is going to start on them. What did Luke say in Luke 21? That some of them will be taken into prison, some of them will be killed. And it was all in the what? Not before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So there's going to be church persecution against these Luke remnant workers. Now what happens? The apostles and the, mo so the modern day apostles and the modern-day Smyrna disciples, who are the ones of the Luke remnant group, are now going to start working. They're both going to remain during the time of seals. And then what happens? Around mid-seals, say about two and a half or so years in, what happens? Antichrist is going to show up. The typology of Constantine. At this point, they're now going to what? The new Christians that were all coming to Christ during the first about two and a half years, it's going to be the time of fleeing into the wilderness. Which fleeing into the wilderness is it? This is the one from Mark's discourse. The Antichrist comes up, the beast shows up, the mark of the beast comes, and this is the fleeing into the wilderness or mountains from um, Mark's discourse. And then what? The second half of trumpets from that point forward is the dark age and the time of the wilderness. Now what happens? At the end of seals... At the end of the sixth year of seals, which represents to this point here, then what happens? The Lord is coming in the clouds with heavenly Mount Zion, and it represents the time of Sardis. So what is it called? It was the time of the church reformation. We know that it was also in the was is part of Israel's kings. Well, when Jesus returns in the clouds at the end of seals, and it's the time for the Reformation. The church is going in the great multitude rapture. We know that Christ is going to be the high priest and king, right? The king of Israel, the high priest and king. Mm -hmm. This Sardis represents that seventh year of seals when the Lord is here and the great multitude rapture has come in. So when we come back to see what Sardis is talking about, this is a picture of the Lord having come at the end of the sixth year of seals, he's now here at the seventh seal, in the seventh year, not seventh seal, but in the seventh year, and look at what we're seeing. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. There are a few names. Of course, we know some will be in white, blotted out others. We see that they're in white raiment. We see in Revelation 7, there are some clothed in white and those holding palms in their hands. So what are we seeing with this watch? This watch is the one that we can connect to Mark 13 when he's telling them that they should have been watching right here. Lest he come suddenly and find them sleeping. 
what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So when we understand the seven churches and the revelation of the end of days seven churches, this whole thing with the Sardis and, and this watch and everything that's being spoken about is literally the end of Mark's gospel. It's the one to the time of uh, the great multitude rapture and him pre-warning them to be ready and watching and for that remnant group as well, right? That remnant uh, of workers. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, well, most yeah. people don't know that. You know, most people don't know that. So you can apply it in saying, look, we know that all scripture is for us, right? It's not only for prophecy. We know it's it's to all be taken in and to live by. So you can point to Sardis and say, look, Sardis is telling us that we should be watching so that we're not going to get caught off guard when the Lord comes suddenly. Is that a fair thing to say in the is in taking in the whole word of God? Absolutely. But in the is to come, we know this is the seventh year of seals. And he's talking about this being as the end of Mark's discourse and the seventh year of seals. But in what you're saying, you're absolutely right. Because we're still living in the is. And the whole thing is mm -hmm. to be taken in. And we see watch mm -hmm. is everywhere. We are told to watch. We're told to be diligently seeking him. And it's mm -hmm. generally those who say, oh, because we don't know the day and hour, but then they won't diligently seek. So where is it in Revelation 19? Right? Uh, verse 10, halfway through. I am thy fellow servant, I the testimony of the brethren. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And what happens when people say, oh, nobody knows the day and hour and discourages others? And people mm -hmm. are less willing to go look into prophecy. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Thanks, uh, brother Alan, for that uh, explanation. Because I, I, when I read that, I said, "Oh, this one uh, doesn't match with you know." Before I didn't know about all of this. I, I, I'm just reading the Bible just like a textbook from the university, right? Um, yeah. So when I saw that. I said, oh, this one, uh, like, it seems contradicting to the one that uh, the pastor told me about no one knows the day and the hour. But this one, Jesus is telling us, like, you know, if you need to watch, you know, so that right. you, I will not come as a thief, but you will know even the hour. So so I, I that, uh, that stick to my mind, uh, you know, every time I hear... People say that no one knows the day and the hour, but I, you know, I go to that Revelation 3.3. 3. I mean, in my mind, I know that uh, we are commanded to watch, just like Luke 21, verse 36, right? Watch and right. pray uh, always, right? Oh, yeah. well, I, an, another uh, thing that, that, um, uh, that, you know, the, the, the you know the uh, sleeping church, or not the sleeping church, but the, the people that, that are against uh, 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 not I wouldn't say against, but they would say that, oh, you guys are date setter. Um, can you differentiate the the the, the date setter, and then uh, you know the people that are watching, because when you say the date setter, you know, thus set the Lord. This is the day. This is the date that Christ will come. You know, that's I think that's the date setter. And then you yeah. know, uh, so can you uh, differentiate that? Because I, I always hear you, brother. Uh, um, you know, Alan, when you teach, you always say, "Oh, I didn't hear from the Lord. No, I didn't. There was no vision. Right. You know, it, it is purely based on the scripture. Uh, you know, can you differentiate the two, the date setter, and then you know, people that are watching, just like you, me, and the bride of Christ that are truly watching." Yeah, that's, you know, that was, a, that's a, what you just said is essentially the definition, right? Because if you've got people that are saying, thus saith the Lord, and you, you know it, you know what I mean? Like if they're, if they're always saying the Lord told me this and the Lord told me that, or thus saith the Lord, 
and the time comes and goes and nothing happened, those, of course, they're definitely your date setters. See, when you're studying scripture and you're studying prophecy because you're watching and praying and you're diligently seeking, why would somebody call you a date setter because you're looking mm -hmm. at a specific time? Where, where does this idea of date setting even come from? You know, here, and this, and let me give you uh, something that happens within, uh, you know, when dates are set. You know, it's kind of something that I touched on earlier. When, when there's date setting, it can cause a lot of people stress. Okay? For, for some people, they just don't like it because people end up then getting complacent. They may stop doing things that they know they should be doing and getting done for their family or things in their life. I've fallen susceptible to that too and put things off because I was expecting a date to be happening really soon and it didn't happen. So for some people, they get so absorbed into it and think that it's so absolute that they push everything off. And this is probably one of the reasons why I think that there are some pastors out there who have somewhat of a better understanding but don't want to tell the people because they've mm -hmm. experienced what happens when, when a date is set. I, if, because what happens is even if you say, look, it's not a thus saith the Lord. And I've been saying mm -hmm. this since the beginning of the ministry. It's not a thus mm -hmm. saith the Lord. It's, it's through the revelation of Scripture that we've drawn closer and closer and closer in understanding. And at those times, I believed that we had that understanding to that point, and I believed it was the time. But at no point, never once, did I ever say the Lord told me this or the Lord told me that, or a vision or a dream that this was the time. Never. But what happens is people take it to the next level and think that it's an absolute. Now, there were times when I thought it was pretty much absolute. I, I never said it was absolute. I never claimed the Lord told me it was absolute. But what happens is people will always take it further and treat it for themselves as an absolute. And that becomes mm -hmm. a big problem. And you see, it was never my intention, even within the ministry, <coughs> to, mm -hmm. to go down this road. It's just part mm -hmm. of it. That's why I was saying at the beginning, the revelation is the ministry. It's all about the revelation of his word. Be able to understand him with clarity and understanding that we've never understood in prophecy before. That's been the purpose. But because it's prophecy, we will get more and more and more clarity on all sorts of things as we get closer. And the timing mm -hmm. is one of them. And that's what we've had over the past year. So this is why I say, I don't, whether it's this year or next year or 10 years from now, I, I believe, I know, based on the revelation of Scripture, I can show that if the end of 14 is Feast of Trumpets and the end of 13 to start the 14th is Feast of Trumpets, and the end of six is Feast of Trumpets, and the beginning of the first year is Feast of Trumpets, and I could prove the 50 days before, and I could prove it from the harvests and how the counts mm -hmm. work from the true harvests on the earth, and I could show that it was two months after Jesus' birthday that he would start his 40 days, and I could show all of these things from Scripture. What else do we know? We know in the beginning it was Taurus. So mm -hmm. if God the Father doesn't change because the sun and, move, the sun and moon moved, or the sun moved, but yet the hours on the clock, which are the constellations, have never moved. And we get the revelation of Taurus, and we find out that the count from Taurus, and you do three months, and you get to two months after Jesus' birth, and, and you get to when Enoch was taken. Hello. I'm not searching for when the pre-trib may be anymore. I know that time frame, say, within a couple days, two, three days. I'm not concerned with it anymore. I know that time frame. So I spend the rest of my time bringing understanding of the revelation, of the things surrounding it, bringing about more detail, 
and sometimes connecting those details to details we have about the timing that will even bring more clarity to it. I, I still don't know if it's this year, right? I mm -hmm. believe it's this year. I believe we can go to that count of Jubilees and we can understand mm -hmm. the, the very, very close within a few years, which I believe two of the options passed last year and the year before, which leaves to me only this year. Could it be next year? Yeah, but there's only a window of time that it could happen because of Jesus's words in Luke chapter four. But again, there is no thus saith the Lord. It's through the revelation mm -hmm. of scripture, but sometimes people take it too far. And they'll take it too mm -hmm. far in the aspect of saying, ah, then forget it. I'm going to go do this and I'm going to take my vacation. I'm going to go here. They maybe don't spend so much time in the Lord and, and hope they're, they're going to take their next breath until the time comes. And when it gets closer, then they're going to come back. That's the way a lot of people oh. think. See, so there's, it's always, you're always in a catch 22. You, you get, mm -hmm. you get beat on, even though you didn't say thus say it the Lord, you get beat on if you say it, because then people will turn and go do other stuff. And the whole time, the reason you're bringing this clarity is because you can understand it from scripture and you want to share the understanding of it. And now you're free. Now you're free to focus on drawing closer to the Lord in every other aspect of his word. But a lot of people don't get it. I would say most, especially in the ministry, get it. But the rest of the world doesn't really get it. And I just showed you mm -hmm. how, how confused they are. They go to the day and hour no one knows. And they think it's pre. They go to Matthew and they think it's pre. See, when, when you understand these things in their confusion, and when they know that day and hour no one knows means Feast of Trumpets, but then they go month to this, and then it's this, and I would call that date setting. I don't think date setting is only those who say, thus saith the Lord. Date mm -hmm. setting, <clears throat> excuse me, I, you, could say, you could say that I was a part of date setting before. I, mm -hmm. I really wasn't. Because we had a revelation of the open books being given to us. And we were drawing closer. We were drawing closer. And as we were doing this over the past several years, more of these periods of time would be eliminated. See, we didn't go, we didn't keep going year after year to the same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing. And then every time something comes up in the middle of a month, we go to that, go to that. There's the pre, there's the pre, there's the pre. No, we, we were, kept studying. It started with all of the feasts and these events. And then it became a little bit less. And then we got more understanding of the harvests. And then we realized there's only three times a year. And then within those three, we realized two of them. And then we got the revelation and the scriptures opened up and we realized there was really one. And there was one time a year that this event is tied to. And when we understood that, we were now free to not go from event to event. And along the way, we stopped going from event to event because we got more understanding. When you go to the to most out there, they go from event to event to event to event because they're not spending enough time diligently seeking the word to understand what periods of times the Lord had told us. I mean, Deuteronomy 16 itself tells us three times to the Lord. Right there. Deuteronomy 16, three times to the Lord. Oh, maybe you can look at all those three in a year. Then you shouldn't have to spend every month looking at whatever's this month and whatever's next month and whatever's next month. If you believe that Enoch was taken and that we are a prophetic picture for the pre-trib going as Enoch was, well, if you understand that Enoch was taken at the Feast of Weeks, which most people in prophecy have understood, and maybe if the Feast of Weeks is when Enoch was taken, and there's three times to the Lord when we were to appear to him in Deuteronomy, and Feast of Weeks is one of them, then maybe Feast of Weeks is where you should focus your time. But then what happens? Then they have the rest of the year to focus on the Lord and be diligent in other things. But they don't. Because their focus is on when, 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 when. And they go from event to event to event. And they're not really drawing or being really diligent in the Lord. They're just going from event to event to event. And that is probably date setting, I would say, as well. 
not everybody, because there are some that do that, but incorporate a lot of other studies. That's a good thing to do, obviously. But I'm talking about those who just go from event to event to event, and that's date setting. And those, those would be the classified date setters. We were diligently seeking, and the diligently seeking came through the revelation of understanding that was being given. So date setters, yeah, um, I would say if somebody's saying, thus saith the Lord, and it comes and goes, those are false prophets. They're not hearing from the Lord. It's, it's not even maybe, it's not kind of. They're, they're literally claiming to be prophet, and they're false prophet. Um, if um, somebody's just going from event to event and always trying to find the date and find the date and find the date, and they're not actually being diligent in the Lord, those would be the date setters. There are, there are some out there who do some date setting, but they spend time in Scripture, and they talk on other things as well. I wouldn't really categorize them as date setters, but they're trying to understand some things along the way, and they're, they're helping people with the Word and so forth. I wouldn't really classify that date setters. Okay? And then with us, we had a little bit of a mix of that, but it's because we were going diligently, and, and because of the revelation of the open books that started with the Gospels, grew and grew and gave us more and more and more clarity. So we're completely away from date setting because we now know the time of the year. When we understand the time of the year that it's connected to true Feast of Weeks, and we can literally show why and how and how it all ties in with the discourses. <clears throat> it's, it's not at all date setting. The only issue is, like I said, is, is it really going to finally be this year? I believe so. I don't unequivocally know so. That's not date setting. That's diligently seeking because it's not just the date. It's his word as a whole. Oh, wow. Thanks, uh, Brother Alan, for that explanation because it's easy to throw, um, you know, the blame when the date has passed. And then, oh, you said, you know, even though you didn't say, oh, that said the Lord, it's easy for yeah. people watching on YouTube to make a comment, to throw that, hey, you are a false prophet, you're uh, you know, false teacher, and then you know, that's so easy for people to uh throw that accusation, even though you didn't say, you know, we uh the that's bride right. of Christ or we didn't say, you know, this date, this date, uh, that said the Lord. No, we're not like what you, you, you're just saying. We're diligently okay. seeking the Lord for His coming. And uh, like, yeah, it's true that, you know, if the Lord, uh, say, give you in advance, so uh, in uh, the date, people will be complacent, will be sleeping. Oh, it's not yet, you know, it's yeah. not yet the time. It's going to be next year. Uh, so I think uh, the Lord has places places at where we're at now where okay dig more dig more uh, you know i'm gonna give you through the holy time spirit to draw closer yeah. to him yeah it's yeah. spend your time drawing closer to me of which in prophecy trying to understand timing is connected but now that we can understand what we do we can just spend our time drawing closer to him and look at the depths of details of revelation and things oh, yeah. that continue to build and i mean like you oh, said yeah. if he gave it Five years ago, ten years ago, you know, two months in advance, or whatever the case may be, and it was a thus saith the Lord, and bang, here it is. I mean, what would people do? Could you imagine if 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 everybody, you know, or 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 hundreds of people or whole ministries knew that bang, this is one hundred percent the date? First of all, most of the church wouldn't believe you anyways, and they would still ridicule and mock you. The the rest would still go and, and then go do other things and then come back, hopefully not having, you know, been in an accident or something before, and then would come back and then draw closer, it would still be in the same situation. Mm -hmm. It's it's there's mm -hmm. there's it's it's not necessary for the Lord to tell us when. Because oh, most yeah. people wouldn't believe you anyways. You can yeah. get a thus say it the Lord. You see, it was something I used to ask for as well. You know, Lord, you know, just one. But I know my ministry. Now. I, I know my part. And my part, I'm not receiving, thus saith the Lord's and visions and dreams. I know that I'm receiving revelation through understanding, through reading and being mm -hmm. diligent. I, if I had received, thus saith the Lord. Now, I've never said one. Could you imagine mm -hmm. if I said one, it would have a lot of weight, I would think. But 
you mm. think it would have a lot of weight with with hundreds of other channels out there? No. He mm -hmm. would just say, oh, here he goes. Now Minister Revealed is giving a thus saith the Lord. Oh, yeah, sure. It would make no <laughs> difference. Yeah. The only people yeah. that might care are the people in the ministry who know that I've never said it. So if I'm saying mm -hmm. it, uh-oh, time to pay attention. This might be for real then. You see, because mm -hmm. hopefully they trust me enough to know that I'm never going to say it unless something actually happens. But mm -hmm. is it going to change anything? No, because what are we doing here anyways? We're diligently seeking. We're watching yeah. and praying. Well, if you keep watching Amen. and praying and you keep diligently seeking the Lord, doing what you're supposed to do, what do you need the date for? Who cares? Mm -hmm. We just mm -hmm. want to know that it's close, that it really is. You know, we just want to know that it's not yeah. going to be maybe another five years, ten years. You know, <laughs> it would be it would be comforting to know that it's this year. But who's going to believe you outside of those that understand you? Mm -hmm. You see, it it yeah. wouldn't mean anything. Well, oh yeah, uh, thank you so much for that explanation. But I have a, a another uh, question that I like you to explain, brother Alan. But it's not related to um, uh, somehow it's not related to the the topic um well it's related in for you know uh, partly can you talk about the mount zion feet down and then the uh i know you thought about this but for the benefit of the uh viewers can you talk about the mount zion feet down and then mount of olives uh feet down because in the traditional view the seven year view of the tribulation the uh, rapture happens and then the uh, uh, second coming, right? But uh, with with what uh, what with with our understanding in Zechariah chapter two years that in Zechariah there is you know the, our Lord Jesus will come down uh, on Mount Zion first before Mount of Olives. Right. Uh, yeah, can you uh, expound on that, brother? Uh, just uh, yeah. So it's just like, um, you know, in the in the chart that we were showing in relation to Mark's portion compared to Matthew's portion. So when once you understand the differences within the Gospels in Luke pre Mark mid Matthew post. And you saw it, three watches uh, uh, pre mid and post a taking a taking and a return. You understand that in Mark's discourse. Chapter 13, once you finally, when people get this, as we were showing earlier, when you understand the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not is about the mark of the beast, whereas Matthew's is standing in the holy place, which is because in mid-trumpets, it's when the temple is rebuilt, but in Mark's, it's still the time of the church, which means it's the mark of the beast because the church age till the end of seals is still the temple of God. So it's the time of the mark of the beast. That's one difference. But the thing we were talking about earlier, which is so important, is that Mark's discourse in 1324, but in those days after that tribulation, Matthew said immediately after the tribulation of those days. But Mark said after that tribulation. So you see again, this difference in Mark and Matthew is a difference of, of a specific that tribulation. Well, again, once you start to see these things and notice these things, you're realizing that Mark's, of course, is a portion separate from Matthew's. Then we see, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in, which is the word in, clouds plural. There's no sounding of a trumpet, no trumpet blast or anything, but he's coming in the clouds plural. Well, when we go to Revelation chapter 6, and we see in Revelation chapter 6, at the end of the sixth, at the end of the sixth seal, we see that people are freaking out and they're hiding in the caves and saying the rocks fall on us and, and what? And hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. This is the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. Now, how is he coming? For one, we just saw in Mark that he's coming in the clouds. So 
they may know that it's the Lord coming and they're terrified. A group of people are terrified and seeing that the Lord's coming. But is it because they're actually seeing him? No, they're seeing something coming. But we don't know what that coming is. <clears throat> we do get definitions. If we go to Daniel chapter 2, this is where you start to understand it more, which is Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which shall be made known in the latter days. And we see that uh, Daniel 2.32, the image's head was of fine gold, his breasts and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon the feet that were of iron and clay, and break them in pieces. Then the iron and clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broke into pieces together and became the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. Now listen to this. And the stone, which smote the image, are you ready? Became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, hold on a second. I thought when Jesus comes post-trib, when he's returning as the church told us, feet down on the Mount of Olives, does this sound like Jesus coming on the on, on Mount of Olives? No. It sounds like he's coming with a mountain. With, with the stone that becomes this great mountain. This isn't, this isn't him coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. Yet, what did he destroy? He destroyed the image of the beast. We know that the ten toes are a picture of the, of the ten kings of the beast from Revelation 17. And where do we see them fight against them in Revelation chapter 17? In Revelation 17, we see the war right here, uh, verse 12. And the ten horns, just like the ten toes, which thou sawest are ten kings, which receive no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb. No, oh, we just saw here comes the Lord as a, as a stone and destroys the beast, which is what we know happens in Daniel 7. He destroys the beast, and you see the ten, the, the, the ten toes being these ten horns, which are the ten kings, and here comes the Lord, and he, just, he destroys them. So if they're being killed, and the Lord is destroying them in, uh, in Daniel 2, and he's coming on a mountain or a stone that becomes a great mountain, that's clearly not the Lord coming on the Mount of Olives, where it says in Zechariah 14.4, and his feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst uh, thereof toward the east and so forth. This is when he's coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. He clearly isn't there on the Mount of Olives. Well, look what happens when we read the rest of it. Or if we go back up one verse. In, ver in Zechariah 14.3, it says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. Okay? Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. Okay? Which means when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives and it splits in two, He's going to go fight against those nations. But what does it say next? As when he fought in the day of battle. What? That means, that means when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of the 13th year, when he comes as it was in the days of Noah, in that final 14th year, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. And it's going to be a battle as when he fought in the day of battle. Which means there's one at the end, and there's another one that happened at some point. So we just saw in Daniel, when he defeats the ten kings, 
in Daniel chapter 2, when he comes as a stone that becomes a great mountain, not when he comes on the feet of on uh, um feet down on the Mount of Olives. And we saw in Revelation 17, when he defeats those 10, this is the battle. This this first one, as when he fought in the day of battle. So then what's this second one on the Mount of Olives? Well, this one says, then shall the Lord go fight against those nations as when, which means this was the first one. So what's this one when the Lord's going to fight against those nations? The second one is when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. And it's the one from Revelation 19 when he comes with a vestiture dipped in blood um, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword and with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and tread the winepress uh, of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. This is the second one. This is the one when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. So if we know this is the second one and we know Zechariah chapter 14 is telling us that this second one is when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives. But Zechariah told us that there was one that came first. And we saw in Daniel 2 that it's when he crushes the ten toes and he's on a mountain. And when we go to um, Revelation 17, it's when he crushed and, and when he destroys the ten kings. Well, where can we understand this mountain? Well, if we go to Zechariah chapter 8, we know through a very, you know, it's, it's a mystery. It's a really deep mystery. And only the 14 years Revelation reveals it in understanding why Zechariah has 14 chapters and why Hosea has 14 chapters. There are only two books in the Bible that each have 14 chapters. And Paul tells us in Romans, I think, 9, that Hosea is written to the Gentiles, and there's 14 years. And Zechariah, we know, is written to the Jews, and it has 14 chapters, 14 years. So when we look at chapter 8, it's like looking at seven years of seals and then seven years of trumpets. What do we know starts the seven years of trumpets? The rebuilding of the city, the streets, and the temple. At the beginning of trumpets, the Lord had returned at the Feast of Trumpets in the seventh year. He destroyed in the Daniel 2 and um, end of Revelation 6, uh, uh, Revelation 17, the ten kings, the beast and the ten kings. He's here. The 144,000 are sealed. The great multitude rapture happens. And now when the seven years of trumpets begin, the city, the streets, and the temple are about to get rebuilt. Well, where does it say the Lord is? Well, if we go to Zechariah chapter 8, we read, starting in verse 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with a great jealousy, which you read in Zechariah chapter 1, and I was jealous for her with great fury. See, was. In chapter 1, he is. And then it says, now remember, we saw him coming and crushing the image, the beast, crushing and destroying the ten toes, and it all came crumbling down. And it became a great mountain that he was on, but not Mount Zion, uh, not the Mount of Olives, because he didn't return feet down on the Mount of Olives. Then it says, for the start of trumpets, thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Where do we see the Lord here? He's, he's come on heavenly Mount Zion. He's come with that mountain carved without hand. So what you're seeing <clears throat> in Mark's discourse when the Lord is coming on the day and hour no one knows, he's coming at the end of the sixth year of seals to that start of the seventh on the day and hour no one knows. Destroys the enemies as, as the stone carved without hand becomes a great mountain. That's him coming with heavenly Mount Zion. Then there he is. Starts trumpets. 
and the Lord is on Mount Zion. Well, wait a second. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? If we go to Revelation chapter 14, we see in verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with them the 144,000 having the Father's name written in their foreheads. Here's the Lord on Mount Zion with the 144, which we know comes at the end of the sixth year of seals. <laughs> and the 144 that are sealed after the sixth year of seals to start the seventh, we see in Zechariah uh, 8, there he is on Mount Zion called the mountain of the Lord that he's now on. In Daniel 2, we see him coming and destroying with a stone that becomes a great mountain. And we know that it's his first battle from Revelation 17 before he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives for the next battle, which will be the one from Revelation 19, the, the, the day of the Lord and, and the treading of the wine grapes of the wrath of Almighty God. So we're seeing that at the end of Mark's discourse, the Lord's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, and we're seeing at the end of the trumpet portions, the Lord is returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. And that's the mystery that the church has missed. The church has missed this portion right here. They're unprepared for seals. And when Christ came the first time, the Jews were unprepared. See, the church thinks that they're all protected. I, I, believe, I just say I believe in Jesus and I'm good. You have to have faith first, yes. But if you're not diligently in the Lord and seeking him, then you don't even know who he is. So what are they going to have to go to? Well, just like the Jews, when Christ came the first time, thought they had it all good and everything was fine, and they got left behind, now the church thinks they're all good, and when it comes, what's going to happen? They're going to be left behind. They're going to be left behind. Doesn't mean they're all finished and they, they won't have salvation. It just means they're going to really have to endure and be strengthened in the Lord, which will happen. There will be places of protection. There will be the, the workers that help these people. There will be, you know, fleeing. And I mean, it's going to be seals. By the time of about mid seals, it's going to be worse than it ever was in human history. When the Antichrist shows up and the mark of the beast comes, it's going to be a time worse than ever. But salvation is soon. They're going to be taken in the seventh year in the great multitude rapture for those that are left alive. The majority of the great multitude rapture will be left alive. They, they will be alive for the majority. So let's say there's about 1.2 billion plus that are part of the great multitude rapture. Some are going to die. The majority will be left. I don't know exactly what the numbers are, but majority compared to less than majority. And what's going to happen? At the end of the sixth year of seals, they're going to see him coming on the day and hour no one knows. Because it's about his coming on the day and hour no one knows. But they don't, they, that's not when the rapture happens. The great multitude rapture won't happen until first or second Passover in the seventh year of seals. So you see, the day and hour has, has no bearing even on the mid-trib in relation to uh, a rapture. It's all about the coming of the Lord. And then same down here. At this point, when the Lord's coming feet down on the Mount of Olives, so this, they're seeing something come down, and they're hiding in the mountains. They're seeing whatever this mountain is, and, and they're panicking. That's the mountain of the Lord coming down. That stone that becomes a great mountain, heavenly Mount Zion. Remember, he's coming in John chapter 14 with paradise to receive them unto himself that where he is there they may be also. He's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. And then we get to the end of the 13 years, and at the day and hour no one knows is when they see him coming on the clouds. And then you have the battle of the wine press from Revelation uh, 19, and it's as it was in the days of Noah, which is the one year 
and then it's over, day and hour no one knows, and then 10 days to the Jubilee. But remember, when he comes on the day and hour no one knows in Matthew, and it starts the final year, he's not gathering people to himself there either. Because what happened is those at mid-trumpets, which is about three and a half years into the trumpet judgments, and about the ten and a half year mark, they flew away on the wings of an eagle till the end of the 14th year. Which means when the Lord comes on the day and hour no one knows, they're not being gathered back until after this year is done. And then once that year is done and it's the day and hour no one knows, they're still not being gathered back until the trumpet of the Jubilee 10 days later. And those who were taken into the wilderness to a place protected till Satan's two and a half years was over and the Lord's final year as Noah and the destruction of the enemies, then they'll be brought back from the wilderness for their jubilee and the restoration of all things. So you see, his coming, day and hour, not the rapture till six or seven months later. Comes at day and hour, no gathering to him for one year, and then another day and hour, no gathering of them till 10 days later. So you have these two comings, the first attack, Revelation 17, um, the, the battle that came first as he fought in the first battle, and then you've got, when he returns feet down, the second battle, Revelation 19, coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the mountain carved without hand that becomes a great mountain, and when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Why the church missed it? I don't know except to say that it makes sense that they miss it because they've missed that this is their portion. The ones that are asleep, that aren't prepared. They're only seeing seven years. Why? Because they look through Matthew's eyes because everything they've learned is founded in the Gospel of Matthew and Matthew's discourse. So they've completely missed the first seven years. So it, it's like, you know, I, I don't know what they think. I, what, what, do they, what do you think they say when they're reading this in Zechariah 8? That the Lord has returned on heavenly Mount Z uh, that the Lord has returned and he's dwelling in the midst of Jerusalem. I mean, they don't see it as prophecy. I don't know why. All of Zechariah yeah. is prophecy. All of Hosea is prophecy. They've missed it and it's... You know, they, they believe the end of it, but they don't understand the rest of it along the way. They think, essentially, the only thing left to be fulfilled is Zechariah chapter 14. Mm -hmm. They don't even look at chapter 8 to understand, why is the Lord on Mount Zion? The Lord is there on Mount Zion, and the temple hasn't been built? You see the conundrum? You see, mm -hmm. here they are, reading but the Lord is there on heavenly mount or on Mount Zion in the midst of the people. And then you read the rest of the chapter and he tells them now is time to start rebuilding the temple. Wait a second. The Lord is going to be there and then the temple's going to be built. That doesn't compute mm -hmm. with them because they all think it's the Antichrist who's going to build the temple. And then he's going to proclaim himself to be God in it. It's, it's so much confusion in, in church prophecy. Yeah. And I don't blame I, them. They just haven't received the revelation. Yeah, I don't know anyone who talk about this, brother Alan. Uh, I I know it's few, and uh, you explain it very well uh, about the Mount Zion because in the mainstream, you know, understanding of this catology, it's always second uh, the rapture and then uh, the uh, feet down, you know, second coming, yeah. Mount of Olives. But they skip that middle part, which is the Mount Zion, which, uh, you know, it's clearly, it says in Revelation chapter 14 that he came down to that, uh, uh, he went down yeah. to the Mount Zion, and then Zechariah, uh, he went down, he returned to Mount Zion. So that's a clear picture that, you know, Christ is, is, is here uh, in the midst of the, the tribulation. And, uh, That's right. And a lot of people know, that have studied over the years had, you know, when, when they came to Ministry Revealed and finally understood it, they've explained that to me, too, that one of their mysteries for them 
was how come nobody's talking about the fact that the Lord is on Mount Zion with the 144,000? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't get it. How could, how could he be on Mount Zion with the 144 and yet they were before the throne? I mean, they're, then they, 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 it's, they scratch their head. And, you know, how do we explain that? Well, mm -hmm. In a seven-year thinking, there, there's no way to think it because you see the church for hundreds of years in relation to eschatology thinks there's no returning of the Lord in any form until he returns feet down. At, that the pre-trib happens, and when pre-trib or mid-trib, he's still not coming down. It's just he's taking everybody in the air. So when he takes mm -hmm. everybody in the air, nobody's going to see there's no coming of the Lord. It's not until he returns feet down. Evan understood he's coming as prophet, high priest, um, king. See, they haven't understood those things. Mm -hmm. So those uh, 144,000, they will be uh, the workers for the trumpet uh, tribulation, Brother Alan, right? Yeah, they'll help the seventh year of seals. They'll help bring in the great multitude rapture, and then they're going to work. Well, their, their main time is, yeah, during trumpets. Okay, okay. Yeah, so the 144,000 first before the great multitude. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And uh, I hope uh, I, I, you know, it's for me, it's so clear. And I know that a lot of viewers are gonna, you know, make their eyes wide open. What, <laughs> you know, it's like for the if you're hearing this for the first time, and uh, I would encourage you to go to uh, Brother Allen's uh, YouTube Ministry Rebuild. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, great videos teaching about this. 14 years the three timelines and then um you know and so many other uh teaching that uh he uh you know throughout the years that he has uh, posted uh on his youtube channel but anyway i just want to thank you again brother alan for you know the teaching tonight i hope uh, uh it's clear i i hope i pray that you know the video that we're producing here blesses you uh those that are watching and that uh, you know we will know uh, the timing of the Lord's coming when when we keep watching and diligently seeking Him, and uh, it's been proven. Uh, so thank you again for uh, uh, you know joining us uh, tonight. Uh, if there's no more question, I uh, you can um, cut now the uh, live <laughs> feed. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invite. I, you know, we could talk about this stuff for hours and hours on end, right? So um, yes. I always appreciate it. And hopefully it reaches some people, some some new ones, and, and helps uh, clarify some things for others. And people are always free to email or to post comments and uh, ask some questions as well.